how do I become a better athlete? That was a simple question I had 22 years ago, back when I was 15. I started running track in high school, and I loved it. I thought, this is amazing. I just, I just loved running so much. And I thought, I just want to do this all day. Wouldn't it be amazing if I could make a career out of this? So that's what I set out to do. I thought, OK, I want to do, as most people do, what I want to do all day long. And I want to get paid for it. So I want to be a professional athlete. And of course, then I asked myself, well, how do I do that? What steps do I have to take to be a pro athlete? Obviously, I got to get better. I got to be much better than I was at 15 if I was going to be pro. So how do I improve? So what I started to do was look at what the top athletes in the world were doing. I looked at their training programs. And it really surprised me. I have to say, the top athletes in the world really didn't train that much differently from the average athletes. And of course, I thought they would. I thought that's what made the athlete was the training, right? But it wasn't. There was something else going on there. When I looked into it, I found it was the time period in between the training that made the athlete the recovery phase. So recovery, I realized at that very early age, was the key to this. If you can speed up recovery, of course, you can pack more training into less time. And of course, when you do that, you train more, you recover faster, you get results, and you get them quicker. So I started focusing on recovery and what constituted good recovery. How do I speed it? What do I do? How do I get my muscles, my cells, to regenerate and renew themselves more quickly? And I knew that if I was to have any chance of having a pro career, this answer would have to be resolved. I would have to figure out how to do this. Good nutrition. That's what got me into the industry, is figuring out the answer to that question. There are other things, of course, that constitute good recovery and things that can help speed it along. Of course, there's massage. There's um, light training, there's stretching, there's yoga, there's all these things that are great, but nutrition. I found that good nutrition was the thing that really made the huge difference in recovery. Now, what I really liked about this as well is that good nutrition could offset other areas where I lacked, one of them being talent. So, <laughs> and this is just the raw truth. The great thing about long races, and I started off, as I say, running track, but I started moving into triathlon, longer races, and eventually Ironman. So Ironman triathlon, some of you may know what that consists of. So swimming, biking, running. 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike ride, and then a marathon, so 26.2 miles of running. So a very long event. And what I love about that is that the longer the event gets, the less talent matters. And that's true the more hard work matters as it goes longer. I could never become a world-class sprinter. Just don't have the genetic makeup. It's just the raw truth. But as the event gets longer, as I say, hard work is what really matters. And as I found, hard work can be multiplied and you get more benefit from it if you speed that recovery and the good nutrition is what speeds, up, speeds that up. So I knew that the odds of having a pro career as an athlete were so much increased with good nutrition. Now, what is good nutrition? Obvious question. The question I asked myself, and I tried a whole bunch of different ways of eating. I tried high carb, I tried low carb, high protein, low protein, the whole spectrum of diets that I'm sure many of you have, if you haven't tried them, you've at least heard of them. And some were okay, some worked a little bit. I kept a very tight training journal and nutrition log, so I would compare them. So I could see the great thing about being an athlete is you get the results very quickly. You know if a food is working, and you know if it's not. And because of this tight system I had for monitoring this, I was able to find out what worked and what didn't in a very short period of time. So of course, I could get to this answer, what constitutes good recovery or good nutrition in terms of athletic performance. And like I said, I tried a lot of different things. Nothing really worked. Then I tried plant-based, 100% plant-based when I was 15. And at first it didn't work. I was hungry, I was tired, I didn't recover well at all. And my high school track coach said, what are you doing? What's going on? You're not, not performing well. Even just three weeks ago, you performed better 
than what you're doing right now. What, what's the problem? I was very enthusiastic about this new way of eating because I thought, okay, this is going to speed recovery. It's going to allow me to get better in a short amount of time. This is my ticket to a pro career. So I was, I was very excited, but he, he wasn't at all. Um, he was a great coach, and that, that's the thing that I think bothered me at first is that he was such a good coach, but then I realized that because he was so good and he had had so much success, he was somewhat closed-minded, and that was very unfortunate. Uh, like I say, he coached some of the top athletes in the country, and he had a system, and it worked, and it really did produce results, but he wasn't interested in deviating from that to see if he could possibly get even better results. And for me, that was a turning point, because I thought, okay, if this top-level coach doesn't appreciate the value of good nutrition, probably a lot of other top-level coaches don't either. And then, of course, athletes are not exposed to it. So how do athletes learn what good nutrition is? And keep in mind, this was 1990 when I was starting out, so obviously information back then didn't flow the way that it does today, and information about plant-based nutrition is pretty much non-existent, especially for athletes. If you wanted to uh, find out anything about that, you really had to dig. So I started digging, and I came up with a set of principles that took me a long time to do, by the way. It took me a good 15 years to feel very comfortable in these principles, and I wrote them into uh, my book called Thrive, but that's how it started, was me just looking for a set of principles that could be applied to nutrition in general to boost athletic performance. I did find that plant-based, after a while, started to work. I had made the mistake in the beginning, as I think a lot of people make, and this was sort of became a joke now, that I had not become a vegetarian, I'd become a starchitarian. I was just filling up on starchy, refined foods. So lots of pasta, white rice, white bread, things like that. So, a lot of starch, not a lot of vegetables. So I had to find out what system works. So here are my set of principles. Thrive Nutritional Principles, high net gain nutrition. Now what I mean by that is choosing to eat foods that take less energy to digest and assimilate and return more nutrition. Now I made the mistake for years, and I think a lot of people do make this mistake for obvious reasons. I assume that because a calorie is a measure of food energy, the more calories I would eat, the more energy I would have. Not the case. Obviously, we've probably all experienced eating a big, heavy, high-calorie meal and having very little energy, in some cases falling asleep. People who eat big 3,000-calorie fast food meals do not all of a sudden have a lot of energy. They get tired. Why is that? Well. One of the reasons is because you have to spend a lot of energy to digest and assimilate that food. Energy is like anything else. You spend it, you no longer have it. It's gone. It's like money. You spend money, you don't have it anymore, but you can make an investment and get a return on that investment. So as an obsessive athlete here, I'm thinking, okay, how can I get a better return on my eating investment? If I'm going to spend digestive energy what do I get back? I gotta get something back in return. And what is that that I should be seeking? Well, it's not calories, it's not food volume, it's not mass, it's nutrients. Vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, antioxidants, all these things that we need. So we spend digestive energy, and in return, we gotta get a lot of nutrition in. So I made the switch from eating lots of starchy refined foods, as I mentioned, that have very few nutrients and are hard to digest, low net gain food, a lot of energy out, little nutrition in, to foods that are high net gain. So for example, fruit. Fruit is a great source of carbohydrate, easy to digest, and full of micronutrients. Also, things like pseudo grains, amaranth, quinoa, buckwheat, wild rice, all those things, because they are seeds, technically, they're not grains, so they do digest for most people quite a bit more easily, and they actually have more protein as well, up to around 20% protein, whereas a pure grain uh, would have much less than that. So I found just that little shift allowed me to have more energy, simply through nourishing myself and not uh, depending on, on just more calories coming in all the time. So my caloric intake dropped 20 to 30%, but I found I had far more energy through conservation. Another interesting point, too, is that now I wasn't always hungry. Now, as I mentioned before, I would go through that stage where I was just so hungry when I switched over. My hunger signal was now being turned off. 
when you get the nutrition in, you get the micronutrients in, that chemical hunger signal, that biological one that goes back to our earliest ancestors, turns off. Now, using white bread as an example, you could eat white bread all day long. Your stomach will physically fill up, but chemically, you're still going to be hungry. You're going to keep craving food because there's so few nutrients in that white bread. Of course, then the tendency is to eat more and then overconsume. And then, of course, what happens? You gain weight. It's actually the number one reason for weight gain in North America. It's very simple. It's just overconsumption. We eat too much. But we eat too much because the food we eat, as a standard American, is very low in nutrition and very high in calories. So then, of course, when you're overweight, your risk factor for type 2 diabetes, arthritis, osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, disease goes up. So just by eating nutrient-dense whole foods, that sorts itself out very easy once you make that connection. And for athletes, don't worry about calories. Just eat the nutrient-dense whole foods. It will sort itself out. Yes, when you work out, you will get hungrier. You'll need more food. So just eat more of the same food. So as I say, goal, more nutrition in, less energy out, high net gain nutrition. Sustainable energy, not through stimulation. Another big one. I made the mistake for years of um, not really understanding this, and I think a lot of people don't. Uh, somewhat, again, a little bit counterintuitive unless you really dig into it. So reducing nutritional stress to boost energy long term. Now, stress is stress. Doesn't matter where it comes from, work-related, family-related, doesn't matter. The effect on the body is all the same. Cortisol, the stress hormone, goes up. When cortisol is high, a bunch of bad things happen. One, you physiologically cannot get into a deep phase of sleep called delta. So the problem is, of course, you wake up, you're still tired. What happens when you wake up and you're tired? You crave coffee, you crave sugar. They're stimulants. And they work. They give us energy right away. But it's short term. It's treating the symptom of tea. It's not treating the cause. You want to treat the, the cause, obviously, for it to be sustainable, for it to be long term. But as North Americans, it's very clear we're dependent on stimulants. You look around, you see all the coffee shops, the donut shops, because we are tired. And we're tired because we're not sleeping deeply. We're not sleeping deeply because of a high level of cortisol. And of course, easy answer is, well, reduce stress. But that's not realistic for a lot of people. You can't just quit your job. You can't just like, walk away from your family. You know, these things are maybe causing you stress. So how do you do that? Well, as I learned, and this is very encouraging when I found this out, that 40% of the average North American's total stress could be attributed to poor nutrition. It's huge. And we all control that. Obviously, you all make choices as to what we're going to eat. And if we can help reduce our stress, our overall stress, by good nutrient-dense whole foods, that's huge. And that allows us then to, if we're an athlete, to train more before we reach our stress threshold and have that stress spill over and cause us issues such as poor quality sleep, which, of course, then also slows the rate at which you can recover. So hormonal injury. Now, this was a term that an endocrinologist used with me back when I was first training a lot. And I'd been overtraining, um, and I actually started gaining weight. I was gaining about a pound every three weeks. And I thought, how can I be gaining fat when I exercise a huge amount? It doesn't make sense. And people said, well, you're eating more calories than you're burning. It's the only way it can be. And I thought, no, no, I'm, I'm eating a lot, but there's no way it's in excess of what I'm burning. It's burning a huge amount. But I tried their suggestion. I cut back on the amount of food I was eating. I started gaining weight more quickly, about a pound every two weeks. I thought, how's that possible? Here I am training 35, 40 hours a week, not eating much at all, and gaining a pound of fat every two weeks. Hormonal injury. It's actually very common. It's when cortisol, from whatever source of stress, mine was physical stress of overtraining. It could be emotional stress. It could be work, family, anything like that. Cortisol up, hormonal injury, they're all out of balance. When you have that injury, like I say, very difficult to sleep deeply. You won't get in that deep delta phase efficiently. And it'll be very hard to tone muscle and to lose fat. Extreme cases will gain fat. So if you see people at the gym, they're there on a regular basis, you know, working out. You see them week after week, month after month, maybe even for years, you've seen the same people at your gym working out. They can't seem to make progress. They can't seem to lose those last five to 10 pounds or change their body shape. Now, if you were to go up to those people and ask them what the problem was, I'm not suggesting you do that, but <laughs> if, uh, if you were, I think they'd be surprised. They wouldn't know why. The reason is, though, very likely, when you start looking at them as a person, not as a machine, calories in, calories out, but the, else, the concerns, the stresses, causing cortisol to go up and having that hormonal injury. So you may need to take a step back, 
stop exercising for a bit, really clean up your diet. Plant-based, nutrient-dense, whole food diet, bring down your stress, reintroduce the exercise, and you'll tone muscle very quickly when that hormonal injury goes away. Alkaline forming. Another thing I think is really important. As an athlete, it's even more important. Acid-forming foods, so standard American diet, meat, dairy, synthetic vitamins, synthetic drugs, soda, white flour, highly acid-forming. What happens when you eat that is calcium gets pulled out of your bones to offset all the acidity coming in to keep the blood at a neutral pH of about 7.35. So over the course of a decade, two decades, three decades, your bones get weak and eventually very likely lead to osteoporosis. So that's why we're seeing people now and I see this even more with athletes because they get stress fractures and so on. That's a big problem. So eating alkaline forming foods will make it so that your bones don't become cannibalized. But what really interests me about whole acid alkaline is a reduced inflammation. When you eat alkaline forming foods, so the, the whole foods, the unprocessed foods, the green foods, anything that's green, that pigment in, in plants, it's chlorophyll, it's highly alkaline forming. That reduces inflammation. When you reduce inflammation, you increase efficiency. All of you athletes out there, you know how valuable that is. Think of all the muscle contractions in 10K, half marathon, marathon, and triathlon, that's huge. Every single muscle contraction, if it's easier, if you don't apply as much energy or as much force, you don't spend the energy, you have more of it. So you're conserving with every contraction. That's significant. You, you can become a better endurance athlete overnight. Strength athletes, same thing. Reducing inflammation, you get the ability to lift heavier weight. So eating this way doesn't necessarily make you stronger, but it allows you to lift heavier weight because you're not inflamed, and lifting heavier weight is what makes you stronger. So it paves the way to less inflammation, greater efficiency. So the overall principles here, I think, can be universally transferable from strength, endurance, doesn't matter. I work with a lot of athletes now, a lot of top level strength and endurance, um, NFL, NHL, Major League Baseball, UFC, even some NASCAR people, believe it or not. Um, but a lot of different athletes, and I don't make up their training program, I just do their nutrition, but across the board, their trainers say, what's going on? I can schedule an extra full workout per week with these athletes and their performance is going through the roof. So I just wanna say, you control that. You control your ability to perform. And the longer the event, the more control you have and the more you incorporate plant-based alkaline forming whole foods, the more control you have over your athletic ability. Thank you.